Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Sergey Gavrilets. I'm organizing this webinar series uh, together with uh, Pete uh, Richardson. Um, I'm having some problems with my video. That's why I turn it off. And the webinar series is on human origins and cultural evolution, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the descent of man. And actually, the anniversary is tomorrow. Uh, the book was published on February 24th of 1871. <laughs> Uh, so here's uh, the title page, and uh, also you can see the picture of Darren. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of them. Uh, uh, what makes this one unique is uh, or interesting is that its picture was taken in 1871. That's what you're saying. And now one, that it belongs to a collection that Darren himself believed was kind of the best collection of, <laughs> of photos uh, they taken of him. So. Um, the anniversary is tomorrow, and it's a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Chris Stringer here tonight, who is probably one of the most influential paleoanthropologists uh, now. Uh, Chris um, got his degrees at UCL and in Bristol, and then um, um, he got back uh, to the Natural History Museum in London, where he's been since it's almost 50 years. Chris is currently the research leader in human origins, and he's done a lot of amazing work, um, been involved in a number of different projects uh, and collaborations with many different people. Uh, two probably uh, the biggest projects was uh, he was director of the Ancient Human Occupation of Britain project for more than 10 years, uh, and now he is a director of the Pathways to Ancient Britain project that is kind of continuation of the first one. Uh, Chris has, have, uh, has uh, had uh, hundreds of different papers that has been cited uh, more than 30,000 times. His H index is enormous. All, uh, a lot of extremely interesting papers published recently, including uh, this uh, paper that I have here. Uh, no, it was published in Nature just two weeks ago, Origins of Modern Human Ancestry. Uh, he received a number of different awards and recognitions. He's a member of the Royal Society. And Chris has also done a lot to promote uh, science and uh, research on human origins. He has uh, many different books, and I put just a sample of uh, these books here on this page. So uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to have you here, Chris. Uh, take it away. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, okay, let's see if we can get the slide started. Yep. Right, yes. So, uh, yes, what, what is Homo sapiens? So, uh, well, here are two different views. Um, the geneticist Spencer Wells and I were having a, a discussion for a podcast and here's Spencer saying, I'd like to suggest that we, we wel re-welcome the Neanderthals into our own species and tear down the wall we've built between us and them since their discovery over 150 years ago. And I replied to that, there's no one size fits all for Neanderthal versus Homo sapiens species status. My separation on morphology has to acknowledge that they could interbreed. Spencer's merging from behavior has to acknowledge the resultant species has variation in pelvic and earbone shape beyond any extant ape species. So there are these different views. And obviously, this is about human origins and cultural evolution in general, this series of talks. But for most of this talk, I will not be talking about the archaeological and cultural material. If there's time, I'm going to come back to it at the end. So today, everyone agrees there is only one species of human, Homo sapiens, also known as modern humans. And we come in many different sizes and shapes and colours, but we're unquestionably all members of this single species. But if we go back into the past, even a few tens of thousands of years, we encounter much greater diversity, a number of different lineages, arguably different species of humans. And this diagram shows some of those in the last one million years or so. And even about 70,000 years ago, there were pretty certainly at least five kinds of humans still around on the earth. So we had been evolving in Africa, 
Homo sapiens. The Neanderthals have been evolving in Europe and Asia. In Eastern Asia, there were the Denisovans. And in Ireland, Southeast Asia, two strange small-bodied species uh, on Flores, Homo floresiensis, and on Luzon in the Philippines, Homo luzonensis. So there are different views on how to classify humans. And so here are four crania from the last million years or so of human evolution. Um, a Homo erectus skull, at least for me, on the top left, a Homo hydrobagensis skull on the top right, a Neanderthal skull on the bottom left, and a modern human skull on the bottom right. But how many of these should really be called Homo sapiens? And there are different views on this. So here's a diagram which shows some of these different ideas and some of the people identified with these different ideas. So for Bill Howes, the American uh, anthropologist, there was really only one kind of Homo sapiens, and that was modern humans, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, as he called them. I broadened the concept to, for me, include a group called archaic Homo sapiens. For someone like Gunter Breuer, Gunter would include... Homo heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals in his concept of Homo sapiens. And someone like Milford Warpoff, a multi-regionalist, would even include Homo erectus in this very broad grouping of what he would call Homo sapiens. So these very different views. So we can at least look at what the type of Homo sapiens is. And uh, I wrote a piece with David Notton in 2010 about this. Um, and this is a quote from that, uh, that article. Uh, there was, however, no single person recognised as the type of Homo sapiens until 1959, when Professor William Stern, in a passing remark in a paper on Linnaeus's contributions to nomenclature and systematics, wrote, Linnaeus himself must stand as the type of his Homo sapiens. This was enough to designate Linnaeus as a lectotype, the single name-bearing type specimen for the species Homo sapiens. So there we are. Linnaeus as the type specimen of Homo sapiens. Now, if we could uh, look at uh, Linnaeus's middle ear bones, uh, we would uh, hopefully find that they match with the middle ear bone shape of a variety of modern humans. Um, and we can see here a comparison from the paper by Sturzel and colleagues uh, from about five years ago. They compared the middle ear bone shapes, the malleus, the incus and the stapes with gorillas, chimpanzees, and Neanderthals. And you can see I've circled in red here the modern human variation. And this is based on dozens of uh, uh, middle ear bones of, of modern humans. And you can see clearly distinct the Neanderthals and the great apes. So even from the, the tiny bones of the middle ears, we can distinguish modern humans from these other forms. Perhaps even more diagnostic for Homo sapiens, we can look at this thing called endocranial and cranial globularity. We have a globular shape to the skull. If we look at it from the side, it's very high and rounded. And here's a paper by Philip Guntz and colleagues from uh, a couple of years ago where they got MRI data of about 6,500 modern humans, and they've compared it here, as you can see, with CT data, which includes fossils. You can see here that blue ellipse showing you the uh, range from CT data of modern humans. The yellow ellipse shows you thousands of modern humans from the MRI data. And you can see in red, the Neanderthal group clearly distinct, and two specimens that I would assign to Homo heidelbergensis there in black also distinct. So there is this very distinct shape for modern humans of the brain case and the brain. And here's uh, Norbuyer and Hubelan and Guntz uh, from again a couple of years ago, looking now at endocast shape. So looking at the shape of the uh, inside of the brain case as reflected in the endocast. We've got there on the top left a Neanderthal in red and a modern human in blue. And you can see there that very distinct shape of the modern human. And here is a, a principal component analysis showing you again in blue, the modern day human variation now based on 89 modern human endocasts. 
and you can see the Neanderthals again in a, a red or pink color and Homo erectus in yellow. And these authors thought they could recognize two distinct trends in brain evolution. There's one from the erector shape, if we regard that as primitive towards the Neanderthals, and another running across principal components, one from Homo erectus to present day humans. So again, a very distinct shape here showing up for modern humans. So if we take that modern human shape diagnosed from the shape of the skull, the globular shape, and we can take the Neanderthals distinctive uh, skull shape or ear bone shape or, or pelvic shape, their face shape, and we can recognize a group of Neanderthals and a group of Homo sapiens, terminal members of those two lineages. Genesis estimate that they had a common ancestor about 600,000 years ago. So how far down these lines should we be diagnosing these two species? Well, my view uh, at the moment anyway, is that we should recognize as Neanderthal or Homo sapiens, all members of their lineages back to the time of the last common ancestor. So there will be a lineage of Homo neanderthalensis going back towards the, homo, the common ancestor, and there'll be a lineage of Homo sapiens. Now, this doesn't come without problems, this kind of diagnosis of Homo sapiens, because there we've got examples of a late Neanderthal, uh, La Ferrisie from France on the top left, and a, a modern human from Cro-Magnon, about 30,000 years old from France. And then we've got the common ancestor uh, about 600,000 years ago. If we start to add in fossils, we can add in the Atapuerca material from the Cima de los Huesos in Spain, about 430,000 years old. And from its morphology of its teeth, for example, and from actual DNA recovered from the SEMA, we can place that material early on the Neanderthal lineage. Similarly, in Africa, we can place the Jebel Ehud material potentially as early members also of that Homo sapiens lineage, based on things like uh, dental features and, and the mandible and the face shape. But of course, those early members of those lineages are distinct from the late members of those lineages, because of course, there has been evolutionary change along the Neanderthal lineage and along the Homo sapiens lineage. So that Cima del Huesos material, for example, has a more primitive brain case shape than the late Neanderthal, on average, a smaller brain, and the inner ear bones uh, are distinct from those of the late Neanderthals. And Jebel Ehud, despite having a modern looking face has what seems to be an archaic, a much more primitive looking brain case, not showing the globular shape we find in late Homo sapiens. So how do we deal with that? Well, it is difficult. Uh, one option would be to name those early members of the lineages as different species, but I don't think that option works because I don't think you can diagnose those species any more easily. In fact, I think it's even more difficult to diagnose an early member of those two lineages as distinct species. So I would prefer this sort of model, which is that we have early and late Neanderthals along the Neanderthal lineage, and we have early and late members of the Homo sapiens lineage, but I tend to use the term archaic Homo sapiens for those early members of the lineage, things like Jebelihood, where the brain case shape, for example, is primitive and they don't show the full development of that globular brain case shape that we find in late Homo sapiens. But there are problems with this too, because uh, when we look at a fossil from Nigeria that's only about 13,000 years old from Iho Heleru, this has a brain case shape that is much more like something like Jebel Ehud than it's like something like uh, Cro-Magnon or, or typical modern humans. So we have to accept the reality if we use my diagnosis of Homo sapiens that we have an archaic part of the lineage and we have a, a modern shape, a modern part of the lineage, that there will be at certain times a coexistence of the archaic, archaic Homo sapiens lineage and the, and the modern Homo sapiens lineage. Uh, that is the reality of the situation. So these terms, archaic and modern humans, are not formal terms, they're informal terms, and people will... I recognize use these terms differently according to the characters they value and, and put emphasis on. So what about the origins of Homo sapiens? Well, if we go back to the time I was doing my PhD, uh, and that was, yes, uh, more than 50 years ago when I started, um, nobody really 
suggested that modern humans had uh, an African origin. So we had these different views around. Um, there were people like uh, Hudichka, uh, who argued that the Neanderthals in Europe were good ancestors for modern humans, and we had evolved from Neanderthals. Clark Howell argued that perhaps we had evolved from a more generalized Neanderthal form, an early Neanderthal that was less specialized had evolved in two different directions, in one direction to the late Neanderthals and in the other direction to Homo sapiens. And then perhaps most popularly, there were multi-regional and Neanderthal phase models, which argued that modern humans had evolved more or less across the whole inhabited old world. And that uh, in each continent, we would have uh, a progression from archaic to modern forms in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. And then there was a minority of people, and this including Bill Howes, who argued that given the what he thought rather compact grouping of modern humans in terms of their, for example, their skull shape, he argued that they perhaps had a single rather recent origin, but he wasn't able to say the place of origin. In 1970, um, he argued that there probably was a, a recent origin for modern humans, but it was unknown where that origin was. So these were models I was testing in my PhD. And one of the influential specimens that I looked at on my PhD trip around Europe in 1971 was this fossil from Morocco. So when I got to the Musée de Long, uh, having been going around Europe for, for already for, for more than three months, I'd looked at a lot of Neanderthal fossils by then and measured their skulls. And there was this fossil then in Paris. It's, it's now back in Morocco. Um, and this fossil from Jebel Hood was known as an African Neanderthal. It was thought to be about 40,000 years old. But as soon as I saw it, I recognized that it didn't look anything like the Neanderthals I'd looked at so far. It was distinct from them, and certainly in the shape of the face, it looked more like a modern human. So here was my attempt in 1974 to summarize my PhD conclusions. And we can see there the Jebel Hood specimen um, showing a non-Neanderthal, a non-modern shape. It was somehow intermediate in shape between Neanderthals and modern humans. But at 40,000 years old, supposedly, it seemed too recent, much too recent to be uh, a part of modern human evolution. And there were other African fossils, which I've highlighted here, showing the variation in Africa in the specimens I was looking at for my PhD. Broken Hill seemed really quite archaic. Uh, OMO-1, on the other hand, seemed to be very modern in its skull shape. Uh, OMO-2 was clearly not modern, not Neanderthal. It, it's, uh, it was difficult to classify it. So already a lot of variation showing up in these African fossils. But in 1974, we had only a very poor fix on how old some of these fossils were. So I started to build up this sort of scenario that uh, we maybe had a, a common ancestral form, which I called Homo heidelbergensis, based on fossils like Broken Hill and Petrolona, and that there were two evolutionary trends in, in skull shape from that common ancestor. On the one hand, there was the Neanderthal evolutionary direction, where the main changes were in the shape of the face. So the cranial vault remained uh, archaic, long and low. The face shape was the main thing that changed. And then we had the modern human lineage where we had an opposite trend where the face shape just got smaller um, and the vault shape was the main change, the development of this globular brain case uh, in modern humans. Um, I don't any longer subscribe to this particular model. And there are several reasons for that. One is that a specimen like Jebel Ehud now, we think, is, is probably around 300,000 years old. And there's more material from the site that gives us a better fix on this population uh, of what may be very early Homo sapiens. And what we can say that studies of the face now suggest that, that what seems to be a modern looking face on Homo sapiens is actually maybe primitive because a rather similar facial shape can be found in the late lower Pleistocene and the early middle Pleistocene. So there are fossils that are 600,000 years old from China and ones from Spain that are about 850,000 years old that, all, that seem to have a modern looking face, the sort of face that we find on Jebel Hood. 
And this actually suggests that this face may be the primitive, the ancestral face for both us and the Neanderthals. We kept that facial shape to a large extent and the Neanderthals moved away from it. And so this leads to a re-evaluation, really, of my view that Homo heidelbergensis might be the common ancestor for Neanderthals and modern humans. So on the bottom left there, you can see a, a diagram suggesting that heidelbergensis might be the common ancestor for Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And on here, we've got the change of view about the face, that the face shape of, of modern humans actually could be primitive. We've also got the evidence in the centre there from the Cima de los Huesos that that material from the Cima is not only probably more than 400,000 years old, but it shows already a number of Neanderthal features, and it suggests that the split between modern humans and Neanderthals goes quite deep, and potentially then also specimens of Heidelbergensis go on in time. So the Broken Hill specimen, uh, last year I was on a paper in Nature where we dated the Broken Hill skull from Zambia, which I put into Homo heidelbergensis, and that paper suggests that the fossil is only about 300,000 years old. So Broken Hill itself certainly unlikely to be an ancestor for, for Homo sapiens. It may well be contemporary with the Homo sapiens lineage in Africa rather than giving rise to it. So a lot more doubt now about the nature of the common ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. It's unlikely to be Homo heidelbergensis, and it's likely to be much further back than about 500,000 years old. So the African story has got more complex, and we have to remember that our fossils come from less than 10% of the area of Africa. So there are huge areas of Africa that have produced no fossils for the period of time I'm talking about. Um, even though we know from archaeology that humans were pretty well widespread over the whole of Africa at times, our fossils come from only selected areas where we have good preservation and access to uh, sites where we can find these fossils. And we know now that uh, there are probably at least three lineages of humans in Africa, even 300,000 years ago. We've got potentially a Homo sapiens lineage evolving up in North Africa with Jebeli Hood. Uh, we have, as I've mentioned, the Heidelbergensis lineage surviving apparently in Zambia uh, with the Broken Hill specimen. And down in South Africa, we've got this strange, uh, even more primitive species, really, Homo naledi, still around apparently 300,000 years ago. So a much more complex picture of Africa than, than I would have suggested uh, a few years ago. But I think that we can say that there were modern humans in Africa, at least in some regions, by about 200,000 years ago. So here we've got the Omo Kibish 1 specimen, uh, the cranial reconstruction shown there, and the partial skeleton. And in terms of its cranial shape, that does seem to have a globular cranial vault. It's got a divided brow ridge. There's a chin on the lower jaw. And there's also now a hip bone for this skeleton, which shows the modern human features of a rather narrow pelvis, not flaring. Uh, and so even in the pelvic shape, it looks like this Omo Kibish specimen dated around 195,000 years old is a modern human. But again, complexity, because a few kilometers away from the discovery of Omo 1, we have a very different looking fossil, Omo Kibish 2 shown here compared with Omo Kibish 1. And that specimen does not have a globular brain case. Uh, as I found with my PhD work, uh, it, in my view, does not represent a modern human. It may well be on the Homo sapiens lineage, but it's not a modern human. And if these two are contemporary, uh, I would certainly put them in, in quite distinct populations. And I would only call Omo 1 a modern human. So, of course, we've also got data from our genomes. We have mitochondrial DNA, of course, Y-chromosome DNA, and the genomic DNA, which is now coming through in very large quantities. And for some people, this data shows quite deep divisions in Africa of the early lineages of Homo sapiens. So here from Karina Schlebusch and colleagues, the suggestion that we can see already more than 200,000 years ago, these emerging lineages of modern humans in Africa. And there, as you can see on the, 
on the bottom left of the diagram, this tiny branch coming out of East Africa, which is genetically going to give rise to all of modern humans outside of Africa. So quite deep divisions here if we regard these lineages as, as largely separate for the last 200,000 years or so. But of course, the reality may be much more complex. And I've been involved in work with uh, Eleanor Sherry and colleagues where we've argued that actually um, there may well have been distinct lineages of Homo sapiens in different parts of Africa, which at times went in their separate directions in evolutionary terms, at other times may have exchanged genes with each other. So we end up with a, a rather complex network of the evolution of Homo sapiens over several hundred thousand years in Africa. And here's a quote. Uh, uh, Humans did not stem from a single ancestral population in one region of Africa, as is often claimed. Instead, our African ancestors were diverse in form and culture and scattered across the entire continent. Well, I'm not sure whether I've now say entire continent, but certainly over large parts of the continent. So perhaps uh, a rather complex picture of the evolution of, of uh, modern humans over several hundred thousand years in Africa. And then we come to around 60,000 years ago when geneticists estimate that the main dispersal of modern humans from Africa occurred, the one that led to populations which spread over the rest of the old world. Populations, of course, stayed behind in Africa and continued their evolution there. So how many dispersals were there? Well, this is certainly a, a subject of a lot of dispute at the moment. We can say that modern humans were arriving in Europe at least by 45,000 years ago. Uh, the evidence from Bachukiro published uh, recently suggests we've got modern humans there in terms of morphology, uh, in terms of mitochondrial DNA, about 45,000 years ago. Possibly a much older arrival of Homo sapiens in Eurasia, perhaps what you might call or what some people will call an, an unsuccessful early dispersal of Homo sapiens into Greece. So here, work that I was involved in with Katerina Havati and colleagues, where we studied the Epidema 1 fossil from Greece. And we argued that from the preserved part of the skull, this specimen looks like a Homo sapiens. Uh, it's certainly distinct from Neanderthals, distinct from a Heidelbergensis. The most similar specimen uh, in the analyses we conducted in terms of cranial shape is that specimen on the bottom right from Schkudl, uh, which is, you know, in my view, a, a modern Homo sapiens. So apparently here evidence of an early dispersal of Homo sapiens reaching at least to, to Greece more than 200,000 years ago. But at least the data from the site suggests that afterwards that population was replaced by Neanderthals because afterwards we have the presence of uh, a Neanderthal fossil at the site after the time of Epidemic 1. So perhaps a, 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 an episodic dispersal of Homo sapiens uh, ultimately uh, being replaced by Neanderthals. So that's quite a complex picture, but it does fit with some genetic data that's been uh, published recently, suggesting that there was an early transfer of, uh, of DNA between Neanderthals and modern humans that occurred maybe between 350 and 150,000 years ago. So this is a poorly known part of our and Neanderthal history, but it looks like the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA of Neanderthals was replaced by an early sapiens pattern, which emerged from Africa. So this is something we still have a poor fix on. And it's possible that the epidema fossil from Greece at more than 200,000 years old does represent uh, a population that was involved in this early mixture of genes between Neanderthals, early Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens. And there are further challenges to the view that there was only one major exit of uh, Homo sapiens from Africa about 60,000 years ago, because there are fossils from China and Sumatra, which look like they're modern humans. Uh, we've got teeth from uh, Dokshian, Fuyan Cave, which are thought to be more than 80,000 years old. Uh, these have been challenged recently on some data, uh, but I think it's... You know, it's, it's difficult to dismiss this evidence entirely. And I was involved in work looking at these two modern human teeth from Sumatra, from Lida Ajer Cave, and we dated these teeth to around 70,000 years old. So these two bits of evidence from China and Sumatra suggest that there must have been a modern human dispersal that reached the Far East 
more than 70,000 years ago. And further support for that comes from Australia, from Northern Australia. The Madjababi Rock Shelter has a very deep stratigraphy. And down at about 65,000 years ago, uh, there's evidence of complex technology. There are no fossil humans from here, but complex technology, um, complex technology and, and pigment use, extensive pigment use in levels dated at 65,000 years old and assumed to be be the work of modern humans. So this again would suggest that modern humans have managed to penetrate and reach as far as Australia by 65,000 years ago. So we do have a problem in, in kind of integrating this data together. So here's a diagram I've, I've taken from Robin Dennell's piece in 2015. And so the argument would have to be that there was at least one earlier wave of Homo sapiens around 100,000 years ago. That managed to go through Southern Asia, it reached China and potentially got to Australia as well. And then there was a second wave, um, the main wave, which geneticists identified modern humans from Africa, starting around 60,000 years ago. And what must have happened, if the genetic data are correct, is that that first wave must have pretty well entirely overprinted any sign of that. that so that second wave overprinted any sign of the first wave. So that's why... When we look at the DNA of people outside of Africa in terms of Y chromosomes, in terms of mitochondrial DNA, and in terms of most of the genome, it looks like that second wave is the one that gives rise to present day genetic diversity outside of Africa. Of course, there is another possibility. Uh, could the genetic calibrations of events be wrong? And uh, we shouldn't entirely dismiss that. Um, the geneticists seem pretty confident about this post-60,000 dispersal from Africa, most of them. But perhaps there is a little bit of leeway in the estimates. And maybe it might be possible to squeeze an earlier dispersal, um, even of that second wave. We'll have to see. So the genomes we got of Neanderthals and Denisovans, of course, show us that we did have a, a complex relationship with Neanderthals and Denisovans, which included clear interbreeding. And I mentioned already this potential early interbreeding of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, maybe more than 200,000 years ago. And we've been arguing about this interbreeding for many years. So, uh, you know, over the years, I was certainly aware that closely related mammal species could hybridize jackals and wolves, for example, brown bears and polar bears. Uh, but my view was, and is expressed there on the bottom left there, if there was any interbreeding, it was on such a small scale, we would not find any trace of it today. That was my view. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, that view has been pretty firmly falsified because it does seem clear that People outside of Africa, pretty well everyone outside of Africa, has around 2% of Neanderthal DNA from interbreeding events that are calculated to have happened mainly between 45 and 60,000 years ago. And we can even find signs of this even up to about 40,000 years ago. So close to the time that Neanderthals were apparently going physically extinct, we can find a fossil like this one from Romania, this jawbone from Oase. It's a modern human jawbone in terms of its main shape. It's got a clear chin on the front, uh, but it has some unusual features, including in the teeth. And when its genome was examined, it was found to have um, around 9% of Neanderthal DNA in it from a recent interbreeding event, estimated that this Neanderthal ancestor was introduced the previous four to six generations ago. So this is a very recent interbreeding event in a, a modern human mandible that's about 40,000 years old. So that interbreeding was still going on, even as the Neanderthals were going physically extinct. And of course, selection then seems to have removed most of that Neanderthal component. So some people estimate the original Neanderthal contribution into the modern humans in Western Asia could have been as high as 10%, but it very rapidly was selected down to levels of 2 to 3% that we find in present day populations. And of course, that DNA is having some effects in our, in our genomes. So this is a quote from uh, the paper by MacArthur and colleagues. The intragast variants remaining in modern humans, in modern Europeans, are depleted of heritability for most traits. However, we discover that they are enriched for heritability of several traits with potential relevance to human adaptation to non-African environments, including hair and skin traits, autoimmunity, chronotype, 
bone density, lung capacity, and menopause age. So certainly 15 years ago, I would have said that for all practical intents and purposes, we're, we're pretty well 100% recent African origin. And what I'd have to say now is that we're more than 90% recent African origin in our genomes. So we are mostly out of Africa. That's, uh, I have to say, I think that term was, I first heard it used by Svante Parbo. So I've got to give Svante the credit for mostly out of Africa, but I think it's a good term. So a bit of unfinished business here, of course, because, uh, you know, there were these different kinds of humans around uh, 70,000 years ago, but by 30,000 years ago, all those other humans, as far as we know, had physically disappeared and we were the last humans around. So why was that? What happened? Well, we can bring in some of the behavioural evidence now uh, and also some of the physical evidence. So, of course, in the last week or so, we've had this claim from a paper published in Science that uh, there were changes in the Earth's magnetic poles that led to a huge increase in radiation falling on the Earth. And this cataclysm produced major effects on the Earth's climate system and the Earth's fauna and flora. And it may have led to the extinction of the Neanderthals. So... I personally think that this argument just goes too far. I think it was a big event. But what we can say is that the Neanderthals did survive after 42,000 years ago. This did not finish them off. Maybe it contributed. Maybe it reduced their numbers uh, and their genetic diversity. But they certainly survived this event, as far as we know, by at least a couple of thousand years physically. And, of course, their DNA survives in, in us today. So here are some uh, headlines uh, which put forward different ideas about what happened to uh, these other humans and how we were successful. So uh, top left, here we are. Homo sapiens were to blame for Neanderthal extinction because they were better hunters and outcompeted them for food, a computer model shows. On the top right, humans replaced Neanderthals because we had bows and arrows and they didn't, a study suggests. And that's an interesting idea, but I think it's actually very difficult to map uh, bows and arrow use uh, with the dispersal of modern humans. Uh, there's certainly some sites where it seems to occur early on, but I certainly don't think it's a, it's a pattern that we can use to map the spread of modern humans and the success of modern humans. Uh, perhaps cave art was involved. A new theory claims Homo sapiens beat out Neanderthals because of art, uh, a reflection of our more complex brains and societies. And then bottom right, uh, the view that Homo sapiens developed a new ecological niche that separated it from other hominins. A new study argues that the greatest defining feature of our species is not symbolism or dramatic cognitive change, but rather a unique ecological position as a global generalist specialist. And I think there's this nice idea from Brian Hare and Vanessa Woods, survival of the friendliest. Uh, just as an excerpt, as humans became friendlier, we were able to sh make the shift from living in small bands of 10 to 15 individuals to living in larger groups of 100 or more. Even without larger brains, our larger, better coordinated groups easily outcompeted other groups of humans. Our sensitivity to others allowed us to cooperate and communicate in increasingly complex ways that put our cultural abilities on a new trajectory. We could innovate and share those innovations more rapidly than anyone else. And then finally, we've got Robin Dennell's view, which is a kind of combined view, probably closest to my own view, really. In summary, we succeeded in colonizing all parts of Asia and eliminating rival species such as Neanderthals because we were more numerous. Well, we could say we became more numerous, had a more diverse diet that increased the survival rates of mothers and infants and combined a longer period of childhood development with a reorganized brain that was cognitively more powerful in inventive, imaginative, and ingenious at colonizing new environments. So a combination of factors rather than one single factor leading to our success. And uh, you can get a bit more on my views from these papers, uh, one by Julie Gal galway Whitam, James Cole, and myself published in 2019 in Journal of Quaternary Science, and the recent one in the last couple of weeks from Nature uh, with three geneticists and Eleanor Sherry, Origins of Modern Human Ancestry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to thank you all for listening and, uh, and thank the people who support my research and all the people I stole all my data and illustrations from. So I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, this, this is great, very, very informative. And, uh, and it's also quite cool that you can revisit your PhD, <laughs> right, <laughs> 50 years later and uh, look at, uh, compare what you thought earlier. Uh, while people are thinking about their Q&As, uh, let me ask you a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is um, about climate, yeah, or yeah, environmental effects. You, you mentioned this, uh, I think, uh, 40,000 years ago. But um, overall, I mean, uh, can you see any signals of climate and of, say, I don't know, glaciation cycles on uh, this story of uh, origins and dispersal of different species? Yes. So, uh, yes, yeah, certainly there's no doubt that climate was a big factor. Um, if we look at the British story, and you mentioned my involvement with the ancient human occupation of Britain project. So there we were studying early human colonization. Uh, and what we found, and of course others had suggested this too, is that you know, Britain's right on the edge of the inhabited world. And because of its proximity to the, to the Atlantic, it's really influenced by the state of the North Atlantic. If the North Atlantic is warm, as it is pretty much today, uh, Britain is very habitable for humans. But if it's cold, extremely cold, and we have even glaciation, it's likely that Britain was completely depopulated. And this happened over and over again. So we think we can map at least 10 separate human colonizations of Britain. And nine of those died out or were unsuccessful, if you want to put it in those terms, ev eventually finished off by climate change. And, you know, we're in that last surviving colonization now, which is only the last 12,000 years. So all of those previous colonizations by probably at least four different species of human died out in Britain. Um, so on the edges of the world, we've got these extremes of climate that are limiting the ability of humans to colonize. And the Neanderthals, I think, you know, they did pretty well. But when it gets really cold, even the Neanderthals disappear. So they had limits to their abilities to adapt to those conditions. And I think it's only with modern humans of the last 40,000 years or so that we really find humans actually staying behind in those extreme conditions and being able to adapt to them. And that we're doing obviously not through physical means, but through our cultural adaptations. So I think we have taken those adaptations to a new level. But when we get back to even modern humans 100,000 years ago, they are really probably as susceptible to the Neanderthals back 100,000 years ago to these climate changes. So the spread of deserts in Africa, that certainly would have been a factor in limiting human populations in separating them off, probably driving some of them to extinction. Um, so, yes, I think that, you know, until the last 40,000 years ago, climatic effects were, were major players on the ability of humans to adapt. But having said that, there's still a surprises. So uh, the earliest human occupation at Haysborough in, in Britain, in, in, in East Anglia, that occupation 900,000 years ago, the climatic data we have from that site suggests that the winters that those people were living in 900,000 years ago were actually slightly colder than the present day. So, you know, we, don't, we, sh we shouldn't uh, say these people were hopeless at adapting, but they certainly didn't have the, the full capability of surviving the extremes of climate that modern humans have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And kind of related to that, uh, if we accept that what makes us distinct uh, from our animals is cognition, culture, cooperation and language, can you speculate when these traits, features appear and to what extent uh, all these other species that went extinct had them. And yeah. then when they well, of course, Yes, it would be great to have the, that kind of information. So I think for language, for example, um, I mean, let's talk about speech first. So I think that obviously people have modeled the ability of Neanderthals to speak. And on some reconstructions, they have a more limited vocal repertoire. You've probably seen the very amusing reconstruction of a, a Neanderthal speaking with a very high pitched voice. Um, and so their vocal tract could well have been a slightly different shape to our own. Um, but I think, you know, uh, you know, people have modeled that Neanderthals could have had reduced vocal capacity. But I think on its own, that wouldn't have stopped them from building from speaking to each other, from building some kind of language. And when we look at their life complexity, 
you know, the fact that they they obviously lived in quite large groups. They obviously hunted cooperatively. Um, they looked after their sick. They buried their dead. So for me, this suggests that, yes, they must have had speech and language. Um, I, I think that comes out of social complexity. So I don't think it would have been as complex as the language we're using now. But certainly I would give them, you know, a basic form of speech and language. Uh, and of course, in terms of symbolic expression, there's increasing evidence that Neanderthals had that as well, that they were using pigments, that they were making uh, markings, that they were, at least in the latter part of their time, uh, using body adornments, creating jewellery. So again, that's a, what we would, used to think was a modern human feature. So I think that complexity is there. But the more like us we make the Neanderthals, uh, then the more of a problem we've got in saying, well, why aren't they still here? And why are we the ones who are here? And it's not only the Neanderthal problem, of course, because we can we can see from their genetic data that the Neanderthals were perhaps a species in trouble towards the end of their time. They were probably low in numbers, relatively low in genetic diversity. But what about the Denisovans? So we've learned about these people over in the Far East. They seem to have been really very widespread, even down into tropical and subtropical areas. Genetically, they probably were more diverse than the Neanderthals, but they also disappeared. So I think it's it's not just a question of the Neanderthals. We've got to have something that explains the success of modern humans across that, that whole range. Uh, and that's quite difficult to do. Um, and that's why I think it isn't down to probably a single advantage. Um, you know, it would be great if there was a, a language gene that suddenly made things different, but I just don't think the evidence is there. And I think we've got a, a much more gradual emergence of complex behaviour, both in the Neanderthal and the modern human lineages, and the growth of brain size in those lineages happening semi-independently. I mean, there was encephalization in the Neanderthal lineage and separately in that of modern humans, and also apparently in the Denisovan uh, lineage too. Um, I'm sure that they were uh, highly encephalized as well, and it will be great when we, we've got more complete Denisovan material to really get a fix on, on what they really look like. But I think they also would have been highly encephalized with complex behavior. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Um, and now some questions um, from the audience. Um, what does the fact that sapiens and Neanderthals seem to have shared parasites tell us about their relative separation? Sorry, could you repeat that one, Sergei? Um, yeah. what, what does the fact that uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals uh, seem to have shared parasites tell us about their relative separation? Shared survey? I, uh, uh, parasites. Parasites? Yeah. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that um, obviously there was intermixture between these groups. So we can say that, as, as I've said, there, there seems to be an, e an episode of interbreeding maybe 200, 300,000 years ago. That might have led to a sharing of parasites. And of course, when we come to the more recent meetings, clearly there was interbreeding in Western Asia, in Europe. Um, between, let's say, probably 45,000 and 55,000, the main events. And that, too, could have led to a spread of parasites and pathogens. And, of course, it's, as we've as indicated by that genetic data, it's likely that we got a quick fix to our immune systems by interbreeding with the Neanderthals. So Neanderthals had evolved um, some natural resistance to diseases outside of Africa. We emerged from Africa with none of those adaptations, by interbreeding with them, we were able to fix, pick up some of their own uh, immune systems that then became beneficial outside of Africa. And I'm sure that it will turn out that the same thing happened with Denisovans. When our early modern humans get over to the Far East, mixing with Denisovans may well have had advantages too for things like the immune system. And we know, of course, that it gave advantages for things like uh, uh, high altitude living. It looks like that also uh, in Tibet owes something to Denisovan genetic variation. So yeah, I think there was probably a sharing of parasites and of course there would have been transmission of, of disease vectors between the populations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, uh, thank you for the great talk. In the example of the 65,000 years old Australian site, 
Uh, you mentioned that we used advanced technology and pigments, so it must be modern humans. But there were no findings of human fossils, and it has been proven that Neanderthals also use pigments and advanced technology. So isn't it possible that uh, the, these activities are results not of modern humans, but somebody else? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, and I've debated this with Australian workers myself, uh, because, of course, the Denisovans from the introgression that obviously the highest level of Denisovan DNA today is found in uh, populations in, in uh, Southeast Asia, in Australasia, um, uh, places like New Guinea and Australia. So it's likely that there were Denisovan populations already in Ireland, Southeast Asia, perhaps places like Sulawesi, Sumatra and so on could have had Denisovans there. So could they have been the ones that got to Australia first? Um, I think it's certainly possible. Um, and until we know more about Denisovan behaviour, uh, I think we, we can't really say how complex their behaviour could have been. Um, what people who work on the Magia Baby site have said is that the stone technology there is very like the stone technology which we find later on in clear native Australian contexts. So when you look at Australian sites that are 30 or 40,000 years old, in their view, you see continuity of culture and pigment use. Um, so the argument will be that continuity suggests that the Mangiabebe people were early Australians in, in a modern sense. But I think until we find the evidence, uh, skeletal evidence, it is an interesting issue. And some people argue that Denisovans could have crossed over to New Guinea and Australia. And I think that's a very interesting issue for the future. Um, but at the moment, the main interpretation of Magia Bebe is that it's probably given the complexity of technology and the very heavy use of pigments uh, that it was modern humans there. But it is, you know, it's not, it's not a settled question. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, about language, uh, but uh, so if Neanderthals also had language, in your opinion, does it uh, push the origin of languages back before we separated from uh, uh, Homo sapiens? Or you can imagine a language uh, evolving convergently in both species? Yeah, I, I think you know, the short answer is we don't really know how far it goes back. But obviously, if we look at even a site like Boxgrove, so we have a site like Boxgrove at... Uh, close to 500,000 years old in, in Britain. <clears throat> and there we've got evidence of, of human groups, maybe estimates of up to 30 people um, sitting around uh, butchered carcasses of, of horse and uh, deer and even rhinoceros. Uh, rhinos are very dangerous animals. So um, if they were really hunting rhinos, that's got to involve uh, a lot of skill and cooperation to do that. Um, and even if you come upon a, a dead rhino, this is an open landscape that they're living in with lions, hyenas, bears, wolves. So while people are methodically dissecting an entire rhino carcass, which they did, um, you've got to have organisation because some people have got to keep the competition away. Those hyenas are going to flock to that carcass. So I think there's a level of organisation there which implies cooperation, and probably forethought in planning where they're going to get their next meal from. So I would argue that even the humans at Boxgrove 500,000 years ago probably had a basic form of speech. Uh, yeah, it wasn't complex. I'm sure it didn't have the need for abstractions and spirituality and so on. But in practical terms, yeah, I, I would give them speech and language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Chris, for the great talk. Do you think it's possible that uh, the Neanderthal brain might be fundamentally the same as the human brain in its internal structure and organization? In the surface shape, difference reflects what you get when you mold essentially the same brain inside different shaped skulls. Yeah, well, we, we can't answer that one, unfortunately. Uh, the internal wiring of that brain is, is unknown to us. But given that uh, we have separate evolutionary trajectories for several hundred thousand years, given that the ear bone shapes are quite different, um, I certainly, my basic assumption would be that the brain evolution would not have been on an identical trajectory. Um, some people have argued 
in the cerebellum, for example, is very important in modern human evolution and the precuneus, which is an area we can't access from endocasts. And those areas seem to be distinct in, in, in modern humans. So we only have a very poor fix on this, but my guess is that, yeah, I would, my basic assumption would be that if the skull shape is different, if the ear bones are different, um, then there will be a difference in the brain. And obviously the Neanderthal brain was large and complex and it didn't limit many aspects of their behavior. They are showing clear aspects of, of human behavior, but I would argue that over several hundred thousand years, you would expect a different evolutionary trajectory. Those brains have been enlarged in parallel uh, with each other on separate lineages. Uh, and something I didn't mention either is the energetic arguments as well. So Neanderthals, of course, we know now that their rib cages and those of Homo erectus were, were much bigger and differently shaped to those of Homo sapiens. Um, and the argument is that Neanderthals, those big brains were energetically very demanding and also their extra muscle power is very demanding. So I think they would have had a different physiology and it's likely that uh, on some estimates, Neanderthal lungs were and, and you know, oxygen demands were some 20% bigger than those of modern humans. So that implies a difference in efficiency, if you like. You know, are we a more efficient model of human, one that needs less energy from the environment and therefore on any given environment, you can support more modern humans than you could support Neanderthals, given their greater energetic demands. So I think that's something to consider as well. And that brain, yeah, it's energetically very demanding and it required a, a lot of energy. That would have certainly put constraints on, on Neanderthal um, you know, food demands, for example, and the number of people that could be supported on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next one. Uh, thank you for the fascinating talk. What do you think about the braided stream metaphor? Should it replace more tree-like phylogenies, <laughs> or is the web thinking a little overstated in the case of recent human evolution? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think, and I've I've written about this. So, yeah, I wrote a paper. Well, maybe uh, six, seven years ago now, called uh, Why We Are Not All Multi-Regionalists. And that paper, um, you know, discussed this this whole idea of the different models of human evolution and whether the braided stream model is, is the one that should now be our, our basic model of human evolution. And I said in that paper that we need both models. We need tree-like structures, and we obviously need, at times, some of these lineages intermingling and spreading DNA. So when we look at the Neanderthals and us, as I've said, the fact that, you know, even from these tiny little ear bones um, that you can tell a Neanderthal from a modern human, that says something about their separate evolutionary history. Uh, the fact that the Neanderthal pelvis is, is quite distinct from a modern human pelvis. The fact that the brain case shape is distinct. The, the facial shape is distinct. The teeth are distinct. So that implies a separate evolutionary history. Um, and largely, for most of the last 600,000 years, I would argue they had a separate evolutionary history. But now and again, they interchange DNA. Uh, it's relatively small amounts of DNA, but we now know the more mammals and birds that we look at for their genomes, the more we see that closely related species do a bit of interbreeding when they get a chance, because it allows them to top up the diversity. Those species can acquire uh, maybe genes that they've lost on their separate evolution, uh, and it also maybe allows them to pick up novelties of the evolution of those other lineages. So this interbreeding is a way of topping up diversity, and that's where the braided streams now and again intermingle. But in my view, unless you have, you know, a first or second generation hybrid, it's always going to be possible to tell a Neanderthal from a modern human if we have their skeletons. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me ask our panelists, uh, speakers in this series, if they have any questions. Uh, Pete? You have a question? Uh, you are muted. Uh, yes, I do have a question. Uh, uh, Chris, it seems like the uh, population sizes of all of these uh, forms were at least occasionally quite small. So I wonder about the relative importance of, of uh, drift versus selection in creating uh, uh, morphological diversity between these uh, between these species or 
some species yeah, that, that are really it, good harm. Yeah, it, it's a good point. Um, and uh, yeah, so Tim Weaver's uh, published on this, and I've I've been on a couple of papers with him as well. And yes, we argued that uh, drift was probably important. So if we look at the cranial shape of modern humans and Neanderthals, um, one can one can really model that drift over several hundred thousand years could be largely responsible for those differences in cranial shape. And uh, I think I haven't got a diagram to call up here to show it, but uh, there's a really nice bit of work. Uh, let me just, um, I'm just going to see if I've got a diagram um, which Philip Guntz kindly let me use. Let's see whether I've still got the diagram and I can call it up here. Um, yeah, maybe, uh, is, it, is it here? Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, this one. Yeah, so let's see whether that will show. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really interesting capture of cranial shape um, for a range of modern humans. So about 250 modern human skulls from around the world, different populations, compared with uh, four Neanderthals, a couple of Homo heidelbergensis skulls, and the one from Cima de los Huesos, SM5. Now, you know, you can start to say, well, principal component two there is the one that shows globularization of the skull. So everything above that line has got the globular shape of Homo sapiens, and the ones below it don't have. And you can see there, and Marta will probably like this one, Jebel Ihud looks much more Neanderthal in its cranial shape than it looks like a Homo sapiens. So that really emphasizes the primitive brain shape but what i really want to pick out there is the astonishing variation on principal component one for those modern human skulls you could lose the variation of heidelbergensis and neanderthal together in that modern human variation so i think this may be evidence that tim weaver uh, is right that what's happened here is that our culture our buffering of culture has allowed us to develop this extraordinary noise, if you like, in cranial shape. I can't think of any functional anatomical evolutionary reason why we should have that variation in brain case shape, in skull shape. Uh, some of it, of course, you know, you could argue the face shape might be a bit adapted to particular conditions. But overall, I think there's a lot of noise there. There's a lot of drift at work in that variation, in that extraordinary variation uh, of human skull shape there, compared with the variation, which seems much more constrained in Heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals. So, yeah, I think drift certainly could be important uh, in the last 50,000 years as modern humans spread out in small numbers around the world. Yeah. Thanks. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, Marta, did you have a question? I, I saw you. Yes, I did. Chris, thank you. Uh, so it was a lovely talk, and I as always enjoyed hearing. Um, my question is regarding your in, at the end of your talk, and when you talk, when you cited uh, the, the, the those conclusions by Robin Dennell, and you say that those are close to yours as well, and you cite the issue that modern humans they had more more children, they were more numerous and uh, they grew more slowly and, and so on. And you know that that is my view as well, that it was a major shift in, in the underlying democracy. Where do you put that? I mean, do you put that, because we're talking, you yourself, we're talking about several hundred thousand years of the evolution of our species, several events of partial colonization of, of Eurasia or colonization at least at foot in, um, so do you put that as something that happened in, in the last 100,000 years? So a very recent biological change in the ancestry of modern humans? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, when we look at, uh, let's say, the African material of 100,000 years ago, um, we can see there that there is... Obviously, over Africa, there's extensive networking. There is some evidence you can build up of larger societies, uh, maybe of uh, longer term survival of, of adults developing a, a greater age. But the fact is that what's still puzzling is that it's really only in the last 45,000 years that we see this this big change uh, of, of the 
adaptive capabilities of modern humans that they suddenly do seem to extend. Okay, they get out of Africa, but even then, there are these, you know, restraints, constraints that seem to hold them back. So there's the Bachikiro people uh, of 45,000 years or so, but they seem to disappear. Uh, those very early Homo sapiens, uh, and you think of uh, the Awasi individual, uh, the one from Ushtishim in Siberia, their DNA seems to have uh, so basically disappeared. So those very early colonizations do seem to have been replaced. Uh, and it's the one after, you know, after 50,000 that is really the one that, that takes off and spreads into those new regions and finally replaces those other human populations. The Neanderthals were not replaced when Epidema you know, gets to Greece. They weren't replaced in, in Western Asia when Mislia is there at 175,000. The Neanderthals came back. Um, the Denisovans obviously persisted, you know, beyond 45,000 years ago in, in across large areas of Asia. So there is something different in the later part of the story, and I haven't got a, a fix on what it was. I do think the Neanderthal story is one of attrition of the genetic diversity in numbers by those repeated climate changes that were happening, particularly in Europe. I think it whittled down their numbers and diversity, um, and that they were probably a species already in trouble, even without having the competition of modern humans arriving to live alongside them after after 45,000. But for the Denisovans, that's a more difficult one to explain. How, I, I don't know what you think about how we replaced the Denisovans. Was it purely demography that we were just more successful? I don't know. What are your thoughts, Marta? Can I turn it back to you? Yeah, so I think that what you said is absolutely what we understand at the moment. I think that gen genomically there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the Neanderthals had moments of important demographic expansion, but they were unable to sustain those, those expansions. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the Denisova, well, I, mean, I don't know, I think that the Denisova lived in pockets, in my view. Because yeah. even the, the Southeast Asian or, or the Denisovan contribution to that we find today in Papuan populations is of a lineage that separated from the Denisova of the Denisova cave 300, 400,000 years ago. So this yeah. is a deep division. So there cannot have been a, a vast, large population across Eastern Asia if they had such, such extraordinarily deep divisions. So in a yeah. way, the two Denisovan sets that we know of, or we can infer they existed, one from the uh, Oceanian populations, they are more dis they have had less contact with each other than Neanderthals and modern humans, or deeper yeah. separation. So for me, they, they were probably pockets of successful locally adapted populations in, in South and Eastern Asia. And then when modern humans arrived in their numbers, they they took over. So that's my current interpretation, given that we have no archaeological record. Yes. Yeah. But it is a puzzle, because I think that obviously we do have universal biological features related to our demography and, and, and our neurobiology. And, so, and that shared ancestry has to predate this big demographic shift that we see later on. So whatever led to that demographic shift was not something profoundly biological. And, and I don't understand it either. I think that we still have to think quite a bit what that was. Right. Okay, now let me ask you a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, the, uh, the first one is about nutrition. Um, how does nu nutrition impact morphology in modern and archaic sapiens? Would nutrition resources and glaciation cycles impact on the resources produce signals in the morphology? Yeah, well, that's really one for the geneticists. I don't think I'm able to really answer that one. Um, I mean, clearly we can look at the genome of a Neanderthal and a modern human and pick up that there are differences between them. But I think uh, even in modern humans, uh, we still have a pretty you know, weak fix on individual genes and how they affect the phenotype. Obviously, genes are working together. Um, and I think the idea that there are maybe single mutations that make a difference is 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 something I you know I'm, I'm really not an expert to talk about that yeah 
Okay. Um, the next one is about this early um, late Pleistocene dental remains in Asia with modern features that you mentioned. Yeah. Would you argue an early dispersal of sapiens out of Africa to be a more plausible interpretation of this when modern features evolving in Asia, like the Chinese multi-regionalists uh, have argued for decades? What yeah. about other features like the flat shovel shaped incisor which uh, was deemed to be by this school to be a linkage between Asian archaic humans and modern populations of East Asia. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the shovel shaped incisors, of course, when you dissect the exact features of those incisors, uh, there's a superficial similarity. Um, I mean, Neanderthals have shovel shaped incisors as well. Uh, so it looks like in Asian populations, there is a particular gene complex. I think it's EPAS1, if I remember correctly, that is linked with uh, that particular dental morphology. Um, and so um, I think that's something that's actually developed quite recently. I think that any connection to the morphology we find in, in uh, Homo erectus populations is, is really a, a, a parallelism. I don't think it really represents continuity. Um, and what we ought to be looking at, I mean, I think maybe a more fruitful area would be uh, the reduction of third molars. That, that, to me, is something that seems to be there in some of these uh, uh, middle Pleistocene humans in, in China. Uh, we see it, for example, in that uh, mandifer from Jiahe, which may be a Denisovan. Um, so it looks like uh, loss of third molars is something which seems to be prevalent in, in the Far East and which allegedly is also more common in recent Asian populations. So that might be more of a continuity feature. I don't think the shovel-shaped incisors uh, are, are going to be a continuity feature. And equally, most of the other features which have been proposed, so Weidenreich proposed and multi-regions proposed, um, I think most of them don't hold up. And particularly when we look at the earliest modern humans that we have in the region, um, they do not look like their Homo erectus uh, predecessors. Uh, I don't think they look like them at all. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I think we should let you go, Chris. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, it got a bit dark here. I've gone into the shadows. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, Thanks for listening. Thank you to Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the good questions. Yeah, and Thank you. to see everybody back next week when Polly Wisner will be talking about hunter governance. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>